Okay, um, and uh, at first I'd like to introduce my sheikh, one of my favorite teachers and my ustad, Brother Tayyib, who is Masjid Dar al-Quran's youth director. He is the head of the Islamic studies and Arabic department at MDQ Academy. He has been leading MDQ youth for years, and he is a vital part of the community, and we've all learned so much from him throughout the years, alhamdulillah. So it's my honor to call up Brother Tayyib and give us our introductory remarks, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, that uh, we are having this event. MashaAllah, this event, uh, we have been talking about it for quite some while, uh, but we did not have the people to make it happen. Alhamdulillah, we have this entire crew and a lot of other people behind the scenes uh, who were able to make this happen. Uh, this is something that is very, very important for our community. Uh, we have lots of kids going into college. College is a very, very, very important time for a person to figure out their identity, to figure out what they want from life, and to figure out what they, what role Islam has inside their lives. Uh, and so, uh, when you go to college, you're able to experience many, many different things. And you have to decide, okay, am I going to choose Islam, or am I going to choose something else? Also, what am I going to do with my life? What is the career path that I want to take? Uh, and so, alhamdulillah, we have a lot of uh, uh, good, experienced individuals here. As you guys can see, we have people who can shed some light on some of these topics for us. We're very, very proud to have these individuals. These are individuals who have grown up inside our communities, uh, who have been part of all of the programs that we have had. And now, alhamdulillah, very, very excited to see them here on this stage, uh, speaking to us and giving us some advice. Inshallah, we are looking forward to having many more of these programs. Uh, we, we, we are planning to have uh, programs where we have uh, speakers come in who are professionals inside their fields, inshallah trying to have job fairs if possible, inshallah. We're looking to do so much more for our, our college students and those people who are actually entering into college. We are looking to have programs where uh, we go through the, the application processes and have people talk to individuals who have already gone through and gotten into the colleges that they want. So we're looking to do so much more and we're very, very excited to have this as our starting point with these amazing speakers here, alhamdulillah. One other thing that I need to mention to you guys uh, is in regards to our food. As you guys see, uh, our food is sponsored by uh, Slap and Chick, alhamdulillah. But I, I do need to mention this uh, be just because I want you to understand uh, this point here. When we were planning this program, we were saying, okay, you know what, we'll just keep it local. We'll have a, a few people. So I reached out to the brother and I said, okay, uh, we're looking to have a program 75 people, okay? And he said, alhamdulillah, right away, immediately, right away, he replied and he said, I'll take care of it. I'll sponsor everything, okay? And then last week, we reached out to him and we said, you know what? Our numbers are somewhere like 100 something. Are you okay with that? He says, fine, okay? Then a couple days ago, I reached out. I'm like, our numbers are about like 150 right now. Are you okay with that? He's like, don't worry about it. This, yesterday, I reached out. I said, we're at 200 now, <laughs> Okay? And then this morning, I texted him, I said, we're at 250, can you make food for 300 people? And he said, alhamdulillah, we're going to take care of everything. Uh, and the only thing that he's asking is for your du'as. Uh, and so uh, we, we, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to, to put barakah in his time, in his, his life, in his uh, wealth, in his business, in his family. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep him and his, his family steadfast. Uh, and I hope that you guys really, really enjoy this program and uh, we can have many more of these, inshallah. So, Jazakum Allah we'll get started right away, inshallah. Okay. All right, Jazakallah Khairan, Brother Tayyib, for that. Uh, and yes, like Brother Tayyib said, you know, we've had many events like this with the youth, but uh, that have been organized, managed, and mainly attended by the youth, but we've never had one this big, mashallah. You, you know, you guys broke a record with 250 plus, mashallah. Uh, at this time, I would like to welcome our guest speaker. He is very well known in our community. He has served as an inspiration to not only the youth of the community, but to everyone else as well with his generosity and most importantly, his readiness and his excitement to help us out. Any event that we have, every qiyam, we ask him to help and he's more than ready and excited and ec ecstatic to help out and to serve his community. And so that serves as, a, as an inspiration for all of us. He doesn't even ask for you know, his mention, doesn't even ask for his name to be said. 
or you know uh, the name of his uh, his place to be mentioned. And uh, again, mashallah, you know he inspires all of us. The name of uh, his amazing bakery is Beach Bakery. It's located in West Hampton. If you haven't tried it out yet, you're just not living life to the fullest. So you really got to try out. What's up? Yeah, uh, well, well, we'll get to that, inshallah. So yeah, uh, you guys got to really try it out. Um, I just want to give you guys some background on how good this stuff is from the bakery. So when we had our first qiyam a little while ago, um, they had banana cream filled and jelly filled croissants. First off, to preface, I'm not a croissant guy. I don't even mess with croissants like that, right? But I was like, yo, these, these look kind of good. So I had one, wonderful. I had a second one, amazing. And I had a few more, and slowly I lost count. And, you know, when you lose count when you're eating something, you know it's just amazing. So when I saw the brother, I went to him, the fudger after, because it was a program was all night long, and I told him, I just love the croissants you brought. He's like, yeah, you know, you're not the only one. These are one of the things that sell out the most. And uh, let me tell you another story about them. So... He had this customer, was from the area, he eventually moved down to Florida, and um, long story short, that, that customer found himself on his deathbed, he was about to pass away, and so his family asked him what his final wish was. He said, I want a box of those croissants all the way from Beach Bakery in West Hampton. And so the brother was more than kind enough to send it to him, uh, you know, to fulfill his, uh, his last wish. So he inspires me and he inspires all my friends here personally with how humble he is, mashallah, how generous he is not only with, with his time, his expertise, but most importantly, in his vision for a brighter future for the Muslim youth in the United States. He's an amazing entrepreneur, and we're honored that he could spare some of his time to speak to us all today. So without any further ado, it's my honor to call up Brother Rashid Saleri. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. It's an honor to be here before you. I look at you and I look at our future. And I am so happy to see you all here. So uh, just very briefly, I want to speak about how you can be a successful business person, how you can embark onto a successful journey on your careers without having to hide yourself. You can be out there, face the world, being a Muslim. But being a Muslim means that you are a Muslim. I'm not a religious scholar, but a few things I know, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept five things in his control. When a person is born, does not matter how hard the doctors or anybody tries, a soul is not gonna be born until it is allowed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When a person dies, doesn't matter how good of a doctor you are, you cannot live forever. You are gonna die, and you're gonna die when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes you to die. Number three, when you get sick. We all know Dr. Hafiz Rahman. He's probably a doctor for most of you. He was a pediatrician, and he just recently had a kidney transplant. He got sick. Everybody gets sick when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would want you to get sick. So these three things given they're not in your control, you cannot control these. It doesn't matter who you are, you're a king, you're a scholar, you're a doctor, whoever you are, you will get sick, and you will die when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would want you to die, and you will be born only when it is wish of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Come down to two things, final two things. Is your risk, the wealth, the money that you would make, and number five is the respect that you will get. Respect, Allah will give you the respect. So my experience is you go and develop the respect for yourself, the wealth will follow you. How do you get respect? When you are a true Muslim, when you put yourself on autocorrect, you learn from the mistakes you make, and you continue to develop your character. You will be respected. 
and that respect starts from your own home, from your family. How do you carry yourself within your bedroom, in your bathroom, when you talk with your parents, when you talk with your siblings, when you talk with your relatives, when you talk with your community? What do you do for your community? What do you do for your family? That will earn your respect. When you go to work, what is your conduct? Are you working just for the money or you're working to gain experience and you're working to help others? That will earn your respect. You don't have to adopt a name Harry if you are a Hassan. You don't have to adopt a name Sarah if you are a Sarah. These are my kids' names, okay? You can be a Rashid Soleri. I am Rashid Soleri. I'm Rashid Soleri wherever I am. If I'm talking with the president, if I'm talking with a business person, whoever I'm talking, I'm not a Harry, I'm not a Sam, I'm not a Tom. And I'm proud to be Rashid Soleri and a Muslim, a devout Muslim, because what I do, I do not leave any room for anybody to point fingers at me. I develop my character and my character helps me grow, earn the money, earn the wealth that I want. So you have to develop your character. That's the number one thing. The money will follow. When I completed my education, since that day, I've never gone to work for anybody. I was always, I've always worked for myself. So I give you a little formula. There are four different ways you can make money. Number one, most people adopt this, that's being an employee. When you're an employee, you are selling your time, you're earning money, working for somebody else, and in return, you earn money. Number two, you save some money, and you start a small business, now you're an entrepreneur. Still, you're working, you're putting in a lot of time, and in return, you're making some money. And your business is generating some money. You still do not have the happiness, the independence, the time that you want to spend with your family and friends. You don't have that. You don't have time to spend your own money. So these are the two, being an employee or being an entrepreneur. Number three is being a business person. An entrepreneur, yeah, is a businessman, but really, the businessman is a person who develops a business and let others work for it. And you make money. This is where you can enjoy some liberties and some time, quality time, and the resources you can use on yourself for happiness. Number four is being an investor. Now you're money, making money from your portfolio. You're investing money in other ventures or other businesses, and that is generating money for you. This is passive income. So I always wanted to be on this side, that I want to be an investor, I want to be a top businessman, and then I want to be an investor where my money makes money for me or other people who make money for me and I live the life I want. So let me advise you this. As you go on to your journey, as you enter into your careers, Try to be on this side as quickly as possible, being a business person or being an investor, okay? And that will happen only wherever you're working, you have a job and you have a character that you develop as a devout Muslim. That character will continue to help you. When you're working for somebody, more than likely it's gonna be a business person or it's gonna be an investor. When you're working for a business person or an investor, he doesn't care if you are a Muslim, if you are a Christian, if you're a Hindu, whoever you are. They're looking at how productive you are, how much you get done for them. I have more than 150 employees. This is all I look at, okay? If a Muslim is working for me and he's non-productive, I wanna let him go. But if a Christian is working good, that is his business ethic, that is his priority, that's how he wants to, uh, to grow. I like them. Everybody who is in this building, who are top officials, they will tell you the same thing. So number one thing is you develop on your character. I started with nothing, and today, alhamdulillah, I do very well with who I am and what I do. 
And all this is because that I never hide my identity. I'm always there as a Muslim. And because I have a character that I developed, I continue to take part and help, whether it is a Muslim charity or it's a Christian charity or whoever it is, nobody walks away without a check from my office. We always are there to help people and people have accepted me. This white community, this white America has accepted me and that this is the right guy who we wanna do business with and we wanna go and buy things from his establishments. So character. Strong character you can build when you always are on the side where that side is giving. Whether it is your home, friends, family, or it is your community, or it is another community which you are not part of. You have to be always on the side that is giving. Okay? So with this, I wanna just go towards another aspect. Brother mentioned that there's a business who is sponsoring your food today. My business and that brother is asking for duas. My business is also sponsoring all your snacks here today. And I'm not asking for duas. I'm a straightforward businessman. I want something in return. And what I want is what is going to make you a better person and start you on this path that would start developing your character and that is giving back into your community. What does our community need? Our community needs more of you, more of the educated individuals. For that, we need more Muslim schools where we can teach our children how to be a Muslim. You will learn how to be a better Muslim in a Muslim school better than you can learn in a Christian school. And we all know there are so many challenges in the non-Muslim schools right now. It is my promise with myself and it is my dream to develop a successful model of a Muslim school and take it nationwide. Our launch pad is the school right here in your community, MDQ. Very recently I joined the education committee and I'm so happy that I joined and I'm part of running the MDQ school right now at this time. MDQ school has acquired a building that is a closed school, it's almost on seven acres and it's in a process of being renovated and ready for our next generation and our kids are gonna be attending school here starting January next year. MDQ school needs about $500,000 to complete its construction project. That is what I need from you guys. I don't need no duas. I need you to come and join us and help us raise this money. Start developing your strong character and start giving back to the community. Do I have a promise from you guys? Who will join me? Who will join me? Okay. So I need you guys to promise to join us. We will show you how before you guys leave today. And everybody here, I want you to raise just $1,000 for the school. $1,000, okay? So we're gonna have a link for you to send to people and it's gonna be $200 per person. So I want you guys to approach at least five person, five family or friends who you believe they can donate $200 and you're not gonna spare them until they, they donate. You're gonna go back to them again and again and again. Have you done it? Have you done it? I need to see it. Have you done it? Have you done it? I need to see it. This will develop a habit of working for your community, giving back to your community, and this will start making yourself better and a better character, at least with me and with our community, we'll be able to say that these men and women have started to work for your communities. And this contribution will go a long way. All these children who will be attending the school, they will be praying for you and they will be praying for me also. 
So I didn't, don't need your prayers for the snacks that I'm giving you. I need prayers for all those people. Jazakullah, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Jazakallah khairan Karasha, thank you so much. Uh, you're all going to have to forgive me. I was supposed to mention that the surprise for tonight was that Uncle Rasha did uh, sponsor the, the desserts and everything. It's just whenever I mention the croissants, I get really excited and you know forget everything else. So yes, Uncle Rasha did sponsor the desserts for tonight, and uh, on the menu is a croissant. So you do have to try that out, inshallah. All righty, at this time, I would like to call up to the podium uh, Sister Mehrina Yasin. She is one of the first graduates from MDQ Academy. She's uh, from the first graduating batch. She received her bachelor's with honors from St. Joseph's University, and she is currently in graduate school studying speech pathology. And her topic is going to be about maintaining your Muslim identity by being confident and sticking to your principles and striving to reach your goals without the biases of others getting in your way. So, Sister Mehrina Yassin. guys can hear me. I might have to stand like this, though. Can you guys hear me? Oh, wow. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm assuming you can. Only after a year. Yeah. Hello. Oh, is this still official? <laughs> Thank you, Shirley, for the intro. Assalamualaikum, everyone. I'm Marina. Alhamdulillah, it's nice to have everyone here. Shout out to my girls that helped me with the event reminder. I think it's amazing that we're having this event. I would have loved something like this before starting college, so I hope it's very beneficial for everybody. As Shirley said, I was in the first graduating class of MDQ Academy, and I was also in the first class of MDQ Academy. I was in MDQ from pre-K to 12th grade. I graduated in 2017 with Shahira, actually. I know. <laughs> and I didn't want to say that we were the best graduating class, but everybody else does. I'm not going to say it, but everybody else does. I'm currently at Malloy University. I'm actually graduating this semester, inshallah, with a double master's in speech pathology and education. So since the topic tonight is about having a successful college career while staying true to Islam, I was trying to think of what would be the number one skill to mention. I thought of things like organization. I thought of things like setting goals for yourself, community involvement, which is all important, of course. But as a Muslim student, the most important skill is confidence. That will be the number one skill. Confidence in who you are. So of course not everyone's college experience is the same. I've been in college now for six years, and this is the first semester where there's another Muslim girl in my class. Specifically in my program, it's predominantly white Catholic women. And in my career in speech pathology, I won't give you guys all the data and the numbers, but majority of the clinicians are white. And a main reason why I wanted to become a speech pathologist in the first place was because I wanted to represent my patients. I wanted to represent the Muslim women and every Muslim, but if anyone's in the medical field, they know that their patients are only gonna make progress when they feel motivated and when there's a support system. So I wanted to be that support system. It's funny because we think people have stereotypes about us that people have stereotypes about Muslims, but we also prejudge them. 
We would think we wouldn't make friends, we would think we wouldn't fit in, or that we have to worry about how we look. Because of this, I was so nervous before I started college. After I graduated from MDQ, I went to Suffolk first, and I didn't really feel disconnected. I kind of just went to school and went home, and that was it. And then when I went to St. Joseph's, COVID hit, so our school was online, so everything was on Zoom. There was no human interaction. But when I went to Malloy, I felt like I kind of was, I just jumped into the world. I jumped into my career. And it was nerve-wracking because all I could think about was how am I going to fit in if I'm the only one who looks different or the only one that acts different. And for most of the people in my program, I was the very first person they met that was Muslim ever in their life, and specifically a hijabi. So of course they've seen Muslims on social media or they've seen Muslims on the news, which we all know is not a good representation of us, but they never interacted on a personal level with a Muslim before. So I wear hijab, I wear long sleeves in the summer, stuff that's so alien to them, but because of Islam, the way I treat people allowed me to make good impressions and it allowed me to make good connections with the rest of my class. Because in a world where everybody cares only about themselves, people appreciate it when you take extra time to be helpful, extra time to be kind, it's valued by others. So instead of this being a negative experience for me, it ended up being a positive thing. Because I tried to be the best representation of a Muslim I could be. Because I figured if any, they met any other Muslim or if they were in a conversation in pub public that was about Islam, what would they think about? They would think about someone they know that's Muslim. And for most of them, it was only me. So I had to work for that. Now I had to show them the character and the values that we stand for. And it was simple things like class etiquette, for example, right? Always participating in projects, trying to take a leader role in projects, and even something like class discussions. So if you're in a class and let's say you're just, everybody has the same idea, but you disagree. In your head, you're like, oh, but I think that I wanna say this, but you don't say it. When you stand up and say what you wanna say that's against everybody else, people will just look at you and be like, wow, like I admire to be that way. I admire to voice what you wanna voice. They'll just, they'll be, they'll be shook. They'll be in, like, they'll be wowed away. And the professor will notice too. And in college, it's very good to make connections with your professors because you want their letters of recommendation. Plus, they're the professionals. They know what's best in your career, right? So you do all of this while still being yourself, of course. Because even though I was different, I've been able to make impactful professional relationships and friendships that will last a lifetime, inshallah. So to be honest, being a Muslim helped me in college. It helped me be a better person. It helped keep me in check. And it was an advantage in a world where everyone looks and acts the same. So before I said be confident, right? But how do we, how do we be confident? Do we go into school like I'm the best person here, no one knows more than me. You meet another Muslim, you're like, oh, I'm a Muslim too, but I'm a better Muslim than you because I do this. That's not, that's not confidence, that's just, that's just rude. Confidence is knowing who you are and not changing yourself to make other people happy, not changing yourself to fit in. Confidence is believing that you have something to contribute to society. Confidence is knowing that the focus of your degree is to help our Ummah, to give back to our Ummah and humanity as a whole. So what is the key to have a successful college life as a Muslim student? Confidence in yourself and confidence in your deen. And if anyone has questions relating to speech pathology or an education career major or just my experiences in college in general, because it's been six years, it's been a long time, you guys can always ask me my number, my email, anything. And while we're eating slapping chicken, I'm so excited you guys could talk to me then. Before I end my speech, I did want to share a quote with everyone that really stuck with me. And when I first read it, I was just mind blown, so I wanted to share it. It said, to understand that Islam isn't meant to burden you, but liberate you. It isn't meant to restrict you, but guide you. It isn't meant to hurt you, but heal you. And once you guys understand that Islam is your friend and not your enemy, you grow with Islam. Thank you.
تكبير 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 جزاك الله خير for that uh, at this time I would like to introduce to you all to the master of ceremonies of this program he is a graduate of Stony Brook University with a bachelor's degree in bio he is currently in the application cycle and applying to med schools may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant him immediate success in that he is of the second graduating class of MDQ Academy and the salutatorian of his class. MashaAllah, he is an established khatib on Long Island. He is a long-standing member of this message and one of the original members of MDQ Youth. He goes by many names, Cher Dog, Cher Dizzle, the Lion of MDQ, my bestest friend. I would like to introduce you all to Cher Ali Khan. Assalamu alaikum. Jazakallah uh, khairan for that very amazing uh, introduction. Alrighty, let's get to it, inshallah. So, what I want to speak about today is what it means to have a Muslim identity and how to have pride in and maintain that Muslim identity in college and beyond. Right? First, let's talk about how it is when we first get to college. Right? We're no longer surrounded by our friends, our family, our siblings. Right, and we're no longer labeled as those kids or those young adults that we were, right? The day we start college, we're now adults. And that brings with it its own set of different freedoms and responsibilities, a lot of which we can't handle right off the bat, right away, right? For example, when you get on a college campus, you're surrounded by people around your age with barely any oversight, right? When you were in high school, you had your parents at home, you had your teachers at school, you always had someone when you were outside, but in college, there's no oversight, there's no supervision. So it's no secret you could do basically whatever you want without anyone stopping you. For example, we know the legal age to drink is 21, but somehow it, alcohol magically makes its way into almost every party in college. So we know how easy it is to get access to alcohol. We know how easy it is to get access to drugs. We know how easy it is to get into haram relationships without anyone finding out. And so, again, like, it's the first time our parents, our teachers, our older siblings, and our aunts, and our uncles, and everyone else that we know, they're not directly over us. And so many of us get lost here, right? Or at the very least, there's some level of confusion there. Because, again, it's not hard to get away with messing around. It's not hard to do things behind your parents' back, right? And you could tell yourself, well, nobody's watching, so I'm going to do what I want. And so it's very easy for you and I to forget that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always watching. Now, for the most part, we were all raised in Muslim households, at least that's the assumption. Um, and we were raised to know what's right or wrong. We were raised to know what's halal and what's haram, right? But this isn't your mommy and daddy's house anymore. This is a college campus. And that brings along with it its own set of challenges. That brings along with it its own set of trials and tribulations, right? And there's all these new things. And one of the things that I think should be really highlighted is a pressure that exists in college, right? You're going to see that a lot of people are going to push you. They're going to pressure you to partake in the same vices that they partake in. Right? Either they partake in them, or at the very least, they want you to be part of the, you know, the process to partake with them for the first time. Because they're new to it as well. You're going to hear a lot of, just take a quick hit, man. Just a quick puff. It's not going to kill you. Just the real one. Right? Just take a quick sip. It's not going to kill you. Stop being a bum and a loser. Just try it out. So there's all this pressure on you. So now you have the dilemma of, should you do it or not? Now obviously the, the very last thing I want to do is generalize and say everyone is like that because that is the farthest thing from the truth. I myself have come across, you know, not that many individuals, but some individuals that are so strong and firm on their deen and their iman and their faith in college where no amount of societal pressure or peer pressure is going to cause them to compromise with their faith, right? But that's not the case for everyone, right? That, that's not the case for every single person. Um, but at the very least, and many of us might be able to relate to this, we get to a point where we know something like alcohol is haram, right? Or a haram relationship, or any other sin is bad, and we know to stay away from it. But there is that little part of us, right? A very small part of us that comes to think, how would it be like? Like, how would this experience be like? Everyone's doing it, and I feel kind of left out, right? We tell ourselves that it's just innocent, simple curiosity. I'm just curious about it. I'm not going to do it. I'm just really curious. But in reality, what it is, is a feeling of being left out. Every single person around you is doing it, so you feel left out. And so sometimes we think, if we take part in it just a little bit, like, let me just dip my foot a little into the sin, right? It's just a little bit, nothing's going to happen. We forget that sin is like quicksand. You could drown in it at any time. So the better thing to do is to stay away from it, and prevent yourself from drowning or disappearing in it. For example, I've had people tell me, who know I'm Muslim, 
who I've made it clear to that I'm not allowed to drink, I never have, I never will, and it's, it's a sin for me, it's haram for me. And they still say, man, you're like, you're like really chill, but like we'd be so much more tight if we got drunk or high together. And that in itself is a pressure, right? They're not going to pass it to me. They know I'd slap it right out of their hand, but they just tell you, right? And that in itself is a pressure. It makes you think, how would it be like? Every single person is doing it. So many parties have it. This is a way so many people bond. So you have that feeling of being left out. And sometimes you ask yourself, am I in the wrong? If every single person is doing it, and I'm not, am I doing something wrong? And so this is where the surety and the trust and the faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes in. Because at the end of the day, we're humans, right? And we're always going to have different pressures from different people. Our family, our friends, university, the society, right? There's always different pressures. And pressure plays a big role in every single thing that we do, right? But part of being human comes with that fluctuating iman, that fluctuating faith. Your iman is not always going to be at an all-time high. It's not always going to be at an all-time low. And it shouldn't always be stagnant because you want it to improve every single day. And so this is where I get to my next point, which is to increase our iman. We need to develop a strong love for Islam and a strong love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to go out of our way to learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fall in love with Islam and with Allah. And obviously, the only way you can do that is by learning about it. Because how can you love? How can you truly love something or someone if you don't know about them or if you barely know about them? And so that's one of the things that allowed me to increase my faith, right? To develop my iman and my faith, I had to go and learn more about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to develop that trust and love uh, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there is no doubt, the more you study Islam, the more you learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you'll without a doubt, without hesitation, fall in love with the characteristics of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and with Islam. And so, I mean, we could talk about all the different names, but we'd be here forever. So let me just go over one of the names, right? One of my favorite names, and I think this was the first name I studied. Um, that is the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is Al-Wadud, which means the most loving. And the name Al-Wadud for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the purest and best form of love. Now, what do, I, what do I mean by that? Well, when I say it's the purest and best form of love, it is that way because it is not selfish in any way. Whereas every single love or every single type of love that exists on this earth is in some way selfish, right? Even the least selfish form of love. Does anyone know what that form of love is on this earth? The least selfish form of love? Somebody can answer. I mean, yes, thank you. But specifically, it's the love a mother has for her child, right? That is the least selfish form of love that exists on this earth. A mother is always going to love her baby, right? But a mother does so because it makes her feel complete. She wouldn't be a mother if she didn't love that child unconditionally, right? A mother would burn for her baby. She would do anything for her child, but it makes her complete. Whereas with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He doesn't need to love us. Whether we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not, it doesn't affect Him in any way. He's always going to be the greatest and the most powerful, irrespective of our love, but He still loves us. So isn't that a characteristic that we should fall in love with? And that's just one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so we're, that's where the first lesson comes in, to go and learn about the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and get to develop that strength, uh, you know, that strong iman. Now, to the next point, there are so many reasons uh, that the Qur'an is so beautiful. But of them is the fact that it applies to every single individual for any condition. Whether you're happy, or you're sad, or you're anxious, or you're lost, or you're confused, or you're excited and ecstatic, whatever emotion it is, the Qur'an addresses it. The Qur'an tells us stories about it. The Qur'an gives us reminders about it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself tells us in the Qur'an, the Qur'an was sent as a mercy to us, right? It was sent to remind us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Isra, and we send down of the Qur'an that which is a healing and a mercy to those who believe, but to the unjust it causes nothing but loss after loss. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, those who believe and whose hearts find comfort in the remembrance of Allah, surely in the remembrance of Allah do hearts find comfort. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that the Qur'an is a mercy for us and that the way to peace, peace of mind, is through the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it becomes obvious that to be a better Muslim, and again, this is a reminder to myself first before it's a reminder to any of you, we need to stick with the Qur'an. We need to stick with the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself tells us that it's been given to us to help us, to guide us, to be able to navigate the difficulties of life. And for us, it's especially important. By us, I mean us college students. 
We just went over the fact that when you get to college, it comes with its own set of difficulties and trials and tribulations. Temptations are being thrown at you right and left every single day. So what are you going to do? You're just going to leave yourself lost and confused? Or are you going to step out of that bubble, study the Qur'an, develop a relationship with the Qur'an, go out of your way to develop that love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then be at peace? Our question is up to you guys. And so one of the best ways to learn about Islam or the Qur'an is to go to your local masjid. We have halaqas, we have lectures, we have events. Quick plug, we have MDQ youth. You're all here today, alhamdulillah. I want to explain something to you guys. It wasn't always this many people, right? It started with like four to five people, I think, right, brother? A few people, yeah, not that many around that. It started with not that many people. And alhamdulillah, after a while, we got 50, 60, 70, 100. Now there's about 250 of you guys. And that happens with consistency, right? That happens over time. And it's the same thing. I'm telling all of you guys, there's so many individuals that have come to the halaqa, right? And they've developed a relationship with everyone else. They've developed that brotherhood. They've developed that sisterhood. They found a Muslim community that they could rely on, that they could consider as a family. And so that's something I wish for all of you. And so a quick plug, come to more of our events. We have halaqa every single week. Sisters have their own halaqa. Brothers have their own halaqa, right? Fridays, yes. We have Monday halaqa from your own Sheikh Tayyib, right? And it's also live streamed. So what excuse do you guys have, right? There's a lot of different opportunities to learn and to develop that relationship with Islam, with the Qur'an, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if not this masjid, there's many other masajids. Go to your local masjid, ask about halaqa. Go to your university and ask about a Muslim club or organization. Check it out. If it's good for you, join it. But I want all of you to understand one very important thing. And we can't make a mistake about this, brothers and sisters. That to get to a strong level of faith and surety and trust and love in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and cement that strong Muslim identity into who you are, it takes time. It takes effort. It takes research. And one thing that can help in your journey is making or becoming part of a group of good Muslims so that you could get to a point where you're confident in your Muslim identity, right? Wherever you are, and no matter what circumstance or situation you're in, no amount of pressure could force you to compromise with your iman and faith. And when your iman is becoming shaky, you have a family, you have a community of other Muslims to reel you back in. So now I'll finish up with the hadith of the Prophet والسلام, about the importance of keeping and maintaining good company. The example, the Prophet والسلام, tells us, the example of a good companion who sits with you in comparison with a bad one is like that of a perfume seller and a blacksmith. From the first, you either buy perfume, right, or you just pass by it. For example, you're passing by a perfume store and the smell just comes to you, even if you don't buy it, right? Or you go and you buy it. It's the same thing with a good friend. You can sit with a good friend and just that five minutes of time you spend with them, you benefit from it, right? Or you hang out with them all the time and it, makes, it turns you into a better person. Or with the example of a blacksmith, the total opposite. You can either pass by the store and get some of the dust and the smoke and everything else to come on your clothes and it's gonna become dirty. Or you could go inside and burn your clothes and destroy yourself. And so it's the same thing with keeping bad company. If you spend five minutes with them, it, it might teach you something bad, right? Just in five minutes. If you spend every single day with them, that's going to change your character. And so that's where the very important point comes in. Small little changes over a period of time is what makes you into the person you are going to be, right? Don't just think about it as like, eh, it's just five minutes I'm spending with them. Eh, I'm just hanging out with them one day. Those small changes over a period of time is either what's going to make you or what's going to break you. So brothers and sisters, my final thing to you is be very careful about the company you keep. Be very picky. I'm not telling you to be judgmental and say, yeah, I don't like that person. I don't like this person. But go out of your way to try to find the right company because that is what will be one of the things that allows you to improve your iman. Jazakallah khairan. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those individuals that develop a strong iman and faith and love for him and develop that strong Muslim identity. Allahumma ameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I was going to sit down and then come back up just to, you know, pretend I'm not a speaker. Uh, at this time, it is my honor to call up and introduce Sister Shahira Amin. Or actually, yeah, yeah. Sister Shahira Amin, a graduate of Stony Brook University. She's a leader of the Young Sisters Youth Halaqa, you know, a position she's held for many years. She's consistently had halaqa for the sisters for many, many years. Mashallah. And the topic that she's going to be talking about is taking into consideration Islamic values when shaping your career and highlighting the adaptability of your faith. She's also a medical social worker 
and uh, hopefully she's going to touch on that topic, inshallah. So if Sister Shahir Amin could please come up. Takbir. Go on my tippy toes, okay? Thank you. Yeah, it's working. Okay. Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala sulla wa ala alihi sahbihi wa ala. Shalak al-khid for the very generous intro um, and to everyone else for attending. So my topic for today is going to is going to be being mindful of Dean uh, in the workplace. And as you are going to choose your major and shape your career, some of the things to consider. Right? Um, Marina really touched on something extremely foundational for really all of us in terms of addressing confidence. So you being a confident Muslim and how people's respect for you increases just because of that confidence that you have when you walk into the room and say that I am a Muslim. Right? Now, I'm going to focus on this idea of being mindful when making choices in terms of your major and as a result of a career, if you're in that traditional path, um, or even if you're just choosing a career path and not choosing a major in school. Right? So I'm going to split it into two, in terms of two different lenses that we can look at um, how to approach this problem. So we want to look at the worldly benefits that we're getting from something as well as the al benefits as, and, and our faith, right? So I'll combine those two. So in terms of the worldly benefit, we're gonna break it again into two. <laughs> so in terms of like finances, so is this major, this career that I'm choosing, this path that I'm on going to be lucrative for me? Is it worth the time and the investment and the effort um, in order to reach the financial goal that I want and the lifestyle that I want? So we also want to consider lifestyle. So if you have certain familial obligations, maybe you want some free time, maybe you don't want to work in certain environments, that's something to look at while you're choosing your major or your career path. Right. Now, when we look at akhirah, we want to look at the legacy that you are leaving. And I don't mean those cute little monuments that people have of like, wow, this person com accomplished all of these things. We want to look at is the legacy, is my, my job, my career path, my major, going to result as a sadaqa jariya for myself? Am I going to be able to help someone in a professional capacity who's going to help someone who's going to help someone who's going to help someone that's going to enable me to accomplish or allow me to reap all of the rewards um, from that one individual that I helped in a professional capacity? Right? So that sadaqa jariya. Now the second one is looking for meaningfulness in your career. So are you content? Are you fulfilled? And I place that under akhirah right, and our, our, our deen because we want, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنْتَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ So I have not created jinn or mankind except that to worship me. So you will never attain fulfillment in this dunya without fulfilling your base principle need of having to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's your initial purpose. You're not going to achieve any form of fulfillment if you don't fulfill that, that base foundation. Right. So we're looking at making this decision and we look through these two different lenses. Right. And I want to challenge us to merge these two lenses because we know that as Muslims, we are supposed to live our deen. As a Muslim, you are supposed to live your, your deen. And in order to do that, there might be some sacrifices that you need to make. Whether it's little things in your day to day or it could be an entire opportunity that you need to sacrifice in order to maintain that goal of achieving Jannah, right? of preserving your Akhira. So let's take a moment to look at the people in the past. So another professional thing, and as you grow, you'll learn, yes, you're a human, you are going to make mistakes, but sometimes other people make mistakes, so it's easier to learn when they mess up. Learn from what they did so, so you don't screw up too. So let's look at the people of the past. So when we look at the people of Ad, if you want to talk about like a hustle culture, people that reach this worldly, secular status, that high status that a lot of us want, right? Whether it's in terms of finances, they had it. Physical strength and health, they had it. In terms of ex extravagant buildings and shelter, they had it. Now, we're talking about a civilization thousands and hundreds of years ago. So Today, we still have these same means, right? We still want a good job. We still want to maintain our health and our, our, our physical presence. And we also want to have a shelter and a nice home. So these needs, these human needs are still there. Now, the people of Ad were afraid 
that once they accepted the message, they were going to be stripped of these worldly things. Now, Huda Salam addresses their, um, their concern. And he says, so, so, O my people, seek your Lord's forgiveness, um, and turn to him in repentance. He will shower you with rain in abundance. So one of the tests they had was that it wasn't raining a lot, right, and they had a drought. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, hey, you guys have a problem, right? And I can solve it for you. You just need to seek forgiveness and turn to me in repentance. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will fix the problem if you do these two things. And then Hud continues on and says, وَيَزِدُكُمْ قُوَّةً إِلَىٰ قُوَّتِكُمْ And he will add strength to the strength that you already have. You are inherently strong and he will add strength to you. Right? And do not turn away persisting in wickedness. So as you grow in your field, there's going to be a lot of opportunities that come up. And when you start job hunting, there's going to be that opportunity. That one application that you filled out that you're like, I'm not getting that. But let me try. Let's see what happens. And then you get an email and they're like, oh my God, they want to interview me. The make or break, that pivotal point in your career. So you think. <laughs> right? Uh, and this is when shaitan is going to come to you and start whispering. The people are going to say, you know what, you not pursuing that opportunity, you'd be an idiot for not pursuing that. And that's everyone's dream goal in this career. You want that. Right? Then shaitan is going to come and whisper and say, all right, we got to nail this interview. How are we going to do it? Right? Maybe when you go on the interview, take the hijab off. Right? You don't want to walk into that room and get stared at and people asking questions. You don't want it. Just take the hijab off for the interview. And maybe as you grow in your role and people start respecting you more, then you can start putting it on. But don't go all the way, just start inching it up. Right? Or maybe shaitan is going to tell you, don't ask for a salah breaks. You want to look like a professional. You want to look like you're a hard worker. Hustle. Right? Don't ask for those salah breaks. No one wants to see the weirdo washing their feet in the bathroom. No one wants to do that. Right? Or shaitan might tell you, change your name. Right? And this is something Brother Solari actually mentioned. I was like, he, I got it from his, uh, his lecture too. But a shaitan might come and tell you, change your name, change your identity. So people don't realize you're Muslim just by looking at your name on the paper. Right? Now, when we start getting these thoughts, we want to take a step back and eye on the prize, right? Eye on the prize of Jannah. We want Jannah. So how are we doing that? And you need to have a conversation between you and yourself and determine what are your non-negotiables. What things that no matter what opportunity presents, I am not giving up these non-negotiables in order to pursue that. It's not happening. Right? So me keeping my hijab on, non-negotiable. I don't care if you don't like it, it's staying on. Right? And this is just for the, the sake of my example. Right? Or, um, or my salah, I'm praying on time no matter what. It's staying intact. I'm making the time. Right? Or... Um, in terms of the name of, I'm going to maintain my identity. I want people to know that when I walk into a room, that yes, I am Muslim. I'm proud of that. I want people to recognize that. Those are my non-negotiables. And as you begin to do these things, you will begin to reap the benefit of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's promise. Right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't mention al-khirah in this ayah. Right? That's something very abstract. Let's look at the tangible. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيَزِدُكُمْ قُوَّةً إِلَىٰ قُوَّتِكُمْ He will increase you in the strength that you already have. Make no mistake, you walking into a room and everyone's head turning to look at you, whether positively or negatively. Right? Everyone's head turns to, to you because you look strange. Right? You're the only hijabi in the room. That takes strength. That takes absolute courage to do. You going on campus and praying behind the bleachers, on the top floor of one of the buildings, all these random things, risking people walking in in the room and being like, is, are they okay? What are they doing? Right? All of that is strength. And Allah Azza wa Jal is telling you here that he will increase you in it. Right? I was trying to not be therapist and talk about feelings, but I'm going to talk about feelings because I can't help it. <laughs> so... Those fears and anxieties that we have of the what if. The what if they don't hire me? The what if every single thing that I have done up until this point was a waste? Right? 
that I, all those late nights studying, all those text messages from people that I really care about that I couldn't respond to, shout out to my friends for being patient with me, um, all of those, all those times, what if that was a waste? I am never going to get that time back. And then this level of desperation comes where you want to start giving things up. And shaitan comes with those temptations of sin. And all of those realities and all of those feelings are absolutely valid. But this is where, now how are we going to step through, how we walk in through this, right, is we re start relying on our iman. We start relying on our faith. And we tell ourselves that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, um, has promised us that we're going to be increased no matter what. Us submitting to him is not going to strip us of anything in this dunya because we're going to be increased in this dunya and in the hereafter. We, we, get, we get both for doing that. Right. So to wrap up my point, so realizing that your deen is meant to be a lifestyle and it is absolutely up to you to work within the confines and the parameters that Allah Azza wa Jal has written for you. We tend to focus on only the, those things that we can't do and we forget all the things that we can. So your faith, your Islam is absolutely adaptable in all of these scenarios. Right. And I understand that it's easier said than done. And when you start to bullet point everything, you start freaking out, you get overwhelmed. Oh my God, how am I going to do all of this? But realize that there will always be a degree of struggle and pain in growth. Right? If there is no struggle and if there's no pain, there's most probably no growth. So it requires that. Right? Now, Sheikh Haifa Yunus, I was listening to a lecture for her, and if someone doesn't know who she is, please look her up on YouTube. May Allah Azza just grant that woman Jannah, absolute powerhouse. She mentioned this quote and she says, uh, So stand up where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed you to stand up. So stand and establish yourself where Allah places you. Right? So know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written all of this for you. Right? That you are meant to be exactly where you are standing up right now. Stop counting the responsibilities because you're just going to freak yourself out. You're not going to realize how much you can do. You're going to underestimate yourself. That's natural, right? And realize um, you will get every single thing done. It might not be all at once, but you will accomplish those goals. And have trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like, in, um, in Allah ma'a sabreen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with those who are patient. So stand where he, azza wa jal, in his infinite wisdom has placed you and fulfill your obligations. So may Allah Azza wa Jal allow us to remain principled on our deen and be amongst those who are able to see the rewards of both our sacrifices in this world and in the hereafter. Allah Ameen. Ajazakallah khair. MashaAllah, MashaAllah, that was a very good talk. Jazakallah khair, thank you so much, Sister Shahira, for that amazing talk. Thank you, Brother Anit, so very kind of you. Uh, oh, right. No, no, no. You know, so the next brother is, is a very amazing brother, mashallah. He actually did not want an intro, but he's funny for thinking I wouldn't give him one. Uh, at this time, I would like to introduce Brother Haytham Amin, one of my oldest and closest friends, my LB, a graduate of Stony Brook University. Who's trying to airdrop me? A graduate of Stony Brook University and one of the leaders of our weekly Friday halaqa to speak about the topic of success, what success truly means, and how to attain it. Who's airdropping? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillahi wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. We're discussing a lot about careers and schooling and college and ultimately success. This program was advertised as attaining success. And alhamdulillah, a lot of the speakers have covered a lot of things that can bring us to that. But now I want to go into what is this success that we're talking about. How do we define this success? What is the defining factor that determines who is successful versus who is a failure? And you see that as Muslims, we have a unique perspective on success. Every single day, about 10 times a day, if you hear the adhan and the iqama, you hear, hayya ala al-falah, come to the success. Come to the success because the thing that will bring you success is the thing that it's calling you towards. Basala. That is the thing that will bring you success. And you'll find this multiple times inside the Quran. 
You'll find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in Surah Al-Mu'minun, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim, Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Qad Aflah Al-Mu'minun, Al-Ladheena Hum Fi Salatihim Khashi'oon. Qad Aflah Al-Mu'minun, Indeed, the successful people are the believers. The ones who say they believe and they prove it with their actions. الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ They are those people who they are humble and attentive inside their salah. And we see this repeated over and over and over again. And in Surah Al-A'la we see قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ تَزَكَّى وَذَكَرَ اسْمَ رَبِّهِ فَصَلَّى قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ تَزَكَّى Indeed, the successful one is the one who has purified themselves. How have they purified themselves? How do we purify our souls? قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ تَزَكَّى وَذَكَرَ اسْمَ رَبِّهِ فَصَلَّى It's by remembering the name of your Lord and praying. Establishing salah is something that purifies us and brings us success. So what is it about salah that brings us success? What is the characteristic of this action that Allah has legislated on us five times a day in specific times of the day that makes it bring about success? What makes it breed success within us? And you'll find that one of these qualities of salah that brings us success is the discipline that we get from it. It's that when we have these apportioned times, that salah is something Allah told us you must do it between this time and this time every single day. By having that, we have a sense of discipline. Allah trains us so that we do what we need to do even when we don't want to do it. He trains us so that when it's time for salah, whether we're doing something that's wasting our time, whether we're scrolling on our phones, whether we're studying for a test, whether we have an exam, or even if we're sitting in a gathering like this and remembering Allah in a blessed gathering. No matter what it is, it will be interrupted by the adhan. It will be interrupted by your salah because no matter how successful we may feel where we are now in whatever action that we are doing, the thing that will bring us more success is the salah. So we are called to that success. So we go and we attain that success from the salah. And that is something that even when we don't want to do it, even when it's cold in the morning and it's time for Fajr, or it's late at night and we're tired, or it's the middle of the work day and Dhuhr is about to end, even then we still have to pray. We still have to establish salah wherever we are. And it trains us to do what we need to do even when we don't want to do it. And that is the first quality of success, no matter what field you go into. No matter if it's medicine or engineering or a lawyer or any field whatsoever, it doesn't matter the field. Something that is necessary for success within that field is to do what you need to do even when you don't want to do it. That is the characteristic. And so what is this success that we are breeding from praying, from salah, from this discipline? What is this success that we have? The Prophet ﷺ, he defines for us success in Sahih Muslim. He says, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ أَسْلَمْ Indeed, the successful one is the one who submits themselves to Allah, the one who becomes Muslim. That is the successful person. And what is submitting ourselves to Allah? It is doing what we need to do even when we don't want to do it because Allah told us to do it. The successful person is the one who becomes Muslim, the one who aslam. And he also continues on. He says that this successful person is the one who they are given some provision from Allah enough for their necessities. Enough to suffice them. Enough food to keep them from being hungry. Enough shelter to keep them safe. Just enough to keep them in sufficient means. And that that person with those means is content with what Allah has given them. That is success. Success is that we submit ourselves completely to Allah and do what we need to do even when we don't want to do it. Then we attain the success and we see that whatever we have, whatever Allah has given us, no matter how much, no matter how little it may seem, that we are content with it. 
that we're comfortable with it. And this is the success that we aim for. Because there may be somebody in school who has hundreds on all of their tests. They may be the top of the school, period. That's it. They are number one. But they also may be the saddest person in the school. They also may be the person who can't live with a 99. They need the 100. Because that person has a lack of contentment. Because that person needs to assess the contentment that they have. Meanwhile, other people, they get the bare minimum of passing, but they're very happy. They're ecstatic, and they're very, very content. You see two different mentalities. You see a mentality of success and a mentality of discontentment. And discontentment leads to ungratefulness. Somebody who is uncontent or discontent with a high score that brings them no benefit beyond that, that is somebody who is ungrateful for the blessings that Allah has given them. But that's not to say to aim for the bare minimum. That's not to say to aim for the bare minimum passing or the bare minimum income or the bare minimum of anything because as Muslims, we are commanded that we keep increasing over and over and over again. That our cycle of improvement doesn't just end in our teens or in our 20s. Our cycle of improvement continues on and on and on. When we reach one level of income, we are content with that. But we still work to get a higher level. When we reach one level of good grades and schooling, we are content with that. But we still aim for higher education, higher learning, more and more and more. Because contentment is not the enemy of growth. Contentment is something that's needed for comfortability, for gratefulness to Allah for anything that we have. But true gratitude to Allah is to use the blessings that he has given us to please him. And by working to improve ourselves over and over and over again, we are using our blessings to reach a potential that Allah has written for us. That he wants for us. And that is showing true gratitude by doing that. And so now, I'll mention an action point. An action point because all of this is a mental battle. Everything that I've mentioned thus far is a mental state of mind. It is that we do what we need to do even when we don't want to do it. And that by doing that religiously, professionally, no matter in any field, we will find success by doing that. And that also being content with what we have because that is true success, being content with what we have while submitting to Allah in any phase. But now the action steps so we can actually attain this success. The steps that we can take to actually see this success within us is number one, that we question our intentions. And this is something I want every single person to do. Sit down for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 minutes. Sit down for as long as you need and ask yourself, why am I doing this? Why am I studying this path? Why am I going to this career? Why am I doing this thing? And to get everybody started, the main purpose of our existence is so that we can worship Allah. And so that's a starting point. Our purpose is to worship Allah in the best way that we can, in everything that we can. And that's not exclusive to just actions of salah and fasting and things like that. That is also, that is also to our jobs and those things as well. We work within both so that we can please Allah and worship Allah in the best way. And I'll end on this last point because they're telling me time is short. So we have our intentions. Everybody should question their intentions today and whenever you get a chance so that we can make sure we're doing things for the right reasons to please Allah, to attain the best blessings that we can and please Him with all the blessings that we have to show our gratitude and contentment with what we have to attain true success. The second point is to work as hard and as smart as we can so that we can attain those things. And this is the last ayah that I'll mention. I'll close in one minute. And that is an ayah in Surah An-Najm, one of my favorite ayat. 
And these are ayat that mention this action of working hard, smart, and with the right intentions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem, wa an laysa lil insani illa ma sa'a, wa anna sa'ayahu sawfa yura, thumma yujazahu al jazaa al awfa, wa anna ila rabbika al muntaha. That there is nothing for mankind except that which they strive for. People may speak a lot of what they want to do, what they aim to do, what their goals are, but if the intention and purpose is not there, there is no discipline so that we can attain them. We will have nothing unless we work for it. Everything that we have is something that we work towards. And so Allah commands us to work hard and to work smart. And that you're striving, you will definitely see the result of that. If you work towards evil, you will see evil. If you work towards good, you will see good. And then you will find the true reward. And that to your Lord is the final resting place. That is the true purpose of everything that we do. To attain the highest rank with our Lord in this life and in the next. So may Allah make us from those who are content with what we have. And may he make us from those who submit to Allah in every aspect of our lives. May he make us from those who have true success in this life and in the next. And may he make us from those who do what we need to do even when we don't want to do it. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik shadu la ilaha ilaha astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaha. Jazakallahu uh, khairan, Brother Haytham. Uh, that was a very beautiful talk from uh, Brother Haytham. Um, what I was talking earlier about, actually, we'll get to that later because we don't have time. So I'll just like to, at this time, I would like to introduce Brother Uni Bawan, who is currently a philosophy major at Stony Brook University. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide him. He is. <laughs> I mean, he is an Islamic studies teacher at MDQ Academy. He's an active volunteer for Al Maghrib Institute, and he has worked hard to grow our Instagram, our TikTok, and our social media presence, mashallah. And his topic is balancing your studies and campus life with your dean, Brother Unib. A uh, really quick announcement. So we're supposed to have Maghrib at 6.35, but it just doesn't make sense to have everyone go up and then come back down. I think that would take too much time. So just be patient with us for just a few minutes, inshallah. His talk is not that long. We're all going to benefit. So just be patient with us for a few minutes. So we're going to pray Maghrib just a few minutes late. Inshallah. Jazakallah khairan. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. One of shaitan's biggest traps that he will throw at you is that he will make you think that you're not good enough to commit to the religion. And another thing that he will throw at you is you don't have time for that. You know, you don't have time to go to this event at the masjid. You don't have time to get up for tahajjud. You don't have time to go to halaqa. You know, you have class, you have exams, you have quizzes. You have to focus on that. You don't have time to go take courses. You don't have time to get up in the morning for fajr, drive to the masjid, pray, then come home, then sleep, then get up again. And back to what I was saying before, when he tells you that you're not good enough to commit, he might tell you that you don't pray the rest of your salahs anyway, so why bother praying fajr? Why bother going to a halqa if you're committing X, Y, Z sin? Why bother putting on the hijab if you're not a devout Muslim? You're just a hypocrite. This is a clear trap that shaitan throws at us, and unfortunately, so many of us are privy to falling to this. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. When we are in university, we have the stresses of campus. We have the stresses of our classes, of our assignments, of our majors. Add on top of that the stresses of our households, right? When you come home, you have responsibilities towards your families, you have responsibilities towards yourself, and you have responsibilities towards your house. And as Maharina put it earlier, Islam is not supposed to be a burden. It's supposed to be something that's liberating. So take it easy. Right? It's okay to struggle. It's fine if you can't do every, you can't pray every single nafil. You're not getting your fatah hajj every single night. You can't make every single halaqa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not burden a soul with more than it can bear. Focus on what's important. Focus on making your salah. 
focus on maintaining your mind in a state of mind that is connected to Islam, but at the same time is also focused on your priorities, right? So many of us are used to the harsh standards that this dunya imposes upon us. Our parents, our teachers, our professors, our bosses, they expect nothing less than perfection. That's what we're told, perfection. You make some mistakes and they come down upon you with fury and it stresses us out. And unfortunately, sometimes shaitan tricks us into applying this same set of standards to the religion. But that's not the case. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't expect us to be perfect. And one thing that I stress over and over again is that Islam is not a religion of perfection. It is a religion of progression. We're not expected to make zero mistakes. We're not expected to be praying all of our salah, which is fard, of course. But on top of that, we're not expected that we're going to every single night get off at the hajjad, right? Every single morning, I'm going to hit my morning athkar. I'm not going to sin once. Never going to sin. That's not the expectation that we have for ourselves. We fall down, but the important thing is that we get back up. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, The one who commits sins, the one who commits israf against himself, return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the all-forgiving. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful that you can commit a sin a hundred times and beg for forgiveness a hundred times and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you a hundred times. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful, why don't you show that same mercy to yourself? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so gentle with us, why aren't we gentle with ourselves? Right? Don't let yourself get stressed with the thought that I'm making mistakes in the religion and I have to focus on my studies and I have to focus on my household. That's how we get burned out. That's how we fall off completely. And unfortunately, there are those who stand up on podiums and they expect the standard of perfection and they point out each and every single one of your flaws and tell you, fix yourself tomorrow, otherwise you are going to hell. And that's not the correct attitude we should have for ourselves because that's not the attitude that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has towards us. We're expected to make mistakes. We're expected to slip and stumble, but at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us that room to get back up, to turn back to him. Because however many times we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guarantees that he will turn towards us. So when you're in your studies, when you're in your classes, right, and you're stressing about your exams, you're stressing about your homeworks, don't forget to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And don't think that just because you can't put 100% of your effort into your religious practices that you should put zero. Don't think that it's all or nothing. No, try your best. It's okay to fail now and then. It's fine. We're humans. So try your best. Try your best. Prioritize. Sometimes you might have to prioritize an exam over the hajjad, right? You might want to get that full night's sleep in. Other days where you have a light week at university, you might want to sacrifice some sleep, get up and pray that the hajjad. And never forget that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is the most merciful, the one who loves you more than your own mother, is always watching over you. The same one that watched over Ismail alayhi salam and caused an endless amount of water to gush forth when he heard the cries of an infant is the same one that watches over you. So don't stress, don't panic, don't be harsh upon yourself. Show yourself some of that mercy at least that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows you and take it easy. And with that, I conclude. Subhana Rabbi ya Rabbi al-Izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-Mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Share. Kabir! Kabir! Allahu Akbar! Kabir! Allahu Akbar! Jazak al khairan brother Nidh. That was a very beautiful talk. Uh, with that, uh, you know, we're going to get started with Maghrib, inshallah. So if the sisters could make their way upstairs, uh, we got to get the dividers out. And uh, we're going to have our outro and uh, last announcement after salah, inshallah. And then we'll go and get some food. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah 
أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله 